Thanks, Max. And good morning, everyone. Good to be with you. We're doing a, a bit of a mini sermon theme on roads. So last week was the road to Emmaus. This week is the road to Damascus. And the roads symbolise a journey of faith for, for different people. Last week was Cleopas and his, his companion. And this week it's Saul, who we know becomes the great apostle, Paul. And as Max read that story, it, it illustrates the transformation of a man literally hell-bent on persecuting disciples, liberated by grace to become the apostle to the Gentiles. It's a wonderful transformation. This is a great story of God's interruption in human plans. It is a road trip that transforms and changes the course of history as it engulfs the hard heart of Saul and transforms him with grace. The journey begins on a road that Saul from Tarsus takes and he's earnestly determined to persecute, to detain, to imprison the followers of Jesus. He's done his best to try and eliminate as many disciples around Jerusalem. Now his vision is to reach out and, and visit other surrounding towns and see if there are any others that he can get rid of. But God has a different journey in mind for this man as he travels. Saul is a man who is zealous. If we read in, in Romans, Saul talks about his zeal. We read, uh, and we will read the passage shortly in, in, um, uh, later on in Galatians, Saul was a man whose passion for righteousness was a religious purity in his eyes. And I wanted to just unpack that a little bit because I think that being zealous for something can be powerful, liberating, wonderful and a blessing. But you can be zealous for evil too. And there is plenty of scriptural precedent and teaching in, 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 in Old Testament scriptures for Saul to use as a weapon to persecute other human beings. You can take scripture and twist it for evil purposes. You can use a verse of scripture and make that a bludgeon to hurt someone. It's possible to do that, but what they can't always control is how God will intervene and change that moment. Luke describes Saul's zeal in this passage as murderous. And it's a threat to the Lord's disciples. I think the, the Greek has got this idea of Saul breathing murder in, in, in his intent. We've just come from Jerusalem where Saul has looked after the coats of those people who stoned Stephen to death. So this is not um, something he's just making up on the way. He's quite intentional about wreaking fear, intimidating and persecuting disciples. He's quite in determined about this. And he believes that's what God wants him to do. And it... It's a disturbing thing for us as believers to know that there are times when people can have a distorted picture of what God is about so that they would use God's name, they would use God's agenda to cause fear, to persecute, 
to make others suffer. It's something that should keep us humble, something that should keep us open to being corrected, open to being challenged about whether our actions are actually filled with grace and convey the grace of Jesus Christ. It's a 220 kilometre journey from Jerusalem to Damascus. So it'll take them about a week. There are no buses. This is a walking trip. And Saul goes with a band of, of others and he goes through the land of Galilee. Galilee, does that ring a bell? That's where Jesus grew up. And I think he would be reflecting a little bit about Jesus as he is travelling on that road. I think he's perhaps coming back to some stories he's heard and he's, he's trying to piece together this person of Jesus that he's heard about that's so disturbing to Saul's sense of what is right. But now he's also being disturbed by his experience of the grace and courage of Stephen who while he was being murdered, prayed for his murderers and asked God's forgiveness on them. This is a different way of being. This is a different way of modelling love. This is a different way of being God's disciple than what Saul has. If you remember some of Romans and, and some of um, Galatians, you'll remember that for Saul, righteousness to the law and obedience to the very fine detail of what the scriptures would expect is the way to heaven. It is being justified by your actions as an obedient disciple of the law. That's how Israel would understand purity. That zealous focus has become a blind spot for him. It has become such an obsession that it's now turned him into a murderer, someone seeking to destroy people. So he's journeying along and he's reflecting on the disruption, the interruption of Jesus in his life and Stephen who modelled Jesus' courage and grace. There will be plenty of time as he is walking to reflect on this, to mull over what he has seen in the extraordinary faith and the purity of Stephen before his murderers. There was something in Stephen's grace and courage about the way Stephen forgave his persecutors, which contrasts so uncomfortably with Saul's own desire for control, his fierce hatred for the threat to his orthodox belief and an intolerance of difference. I think it unnerves Saul because it models Jesus' faith, Jesus' love, in a brave and generous new way. Fundamentalism is a fear of freedom. Ironically, fundamentalism is a way of avoiding faith because it rejects any questioning, any criticism, any doubt any variation from the stated absolute truth. That's what Saul is living with. That's his worldview. And it's an easy way out in a way because the struggle to believe in the face of challenges, in the faces of complexity, of things not being clear or always fair or right, the things that we wrestle with in our weeks, as disciples, those struggles are the things that are hard if you only believe black and white. Saul 
like all of us, he yearns for something to complete him. He yearns for the satisfaction of knowing that he is walking faithfully and righteously. And God knows what Saul needs. God seeks to fill this void with the offer of Jesus Christ as Saul's and our saviour. Jesus is, as the Gospel of John says, full of grace and truth. Jesus models this grace and truth in his life, his death and resurrection. And Saul, I think, starts to recognise there is something distinctive in Stephen's faith, in Stephen's behaviour and his words of forgiveness that's more powerful, more life-giving than Saul's own sense of self. And the difference in essence is love. Jesus' love has transformed Stephen into a person who does not fear death. Jesus' love transforms Stephen into a person who is able to live with things not going his way because he trusts in the one who carries him through life and death and new life. Stephen lives and dies with a lightness of heart, a gracious and hopeful presence. And he models Jesus' life-giving love in those extreme circumstances. And I think Saul can't get that out of his head as he's walking on this road. Somewhere on this road, Saul experiences very profoundly, very personally, the authentic, transforming authoritative presence of Jesus Christ and Jesus doesn't beat about the bush with him and he says Saul Saul why are you persecuting me he's interrogating Saul with a question about himself as he's referring to Stephen and in so doing Jesus tells every reader of the Bible that Jesus identifies with every person who is persecuted, every person, every disciple who is persecuted. You persecute disciples, you are persecuting Christ. <coughs> William Barclay comments that this is not actually a sudden conversion, but it is a very sudden surrender. And despite the drama of this conversion, like that the lights flashing and, and Saul not being able to see and or the, the physical changes in his body, there are a number of theologians who suggest really what's happened is that step by step, grace has taken away the foundations of Saul's resistance to God, resistance to grace. It's a little bit like when Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses on the door of All Saints Church in Wittenberg. That was a profound change in history that began the Protestant movement. But it didn't just happen like that. There were centuries of growth and, and, and decades of resistance to some of the hypocrisy that was happening in the culture and the history of the church at that time which got Martin Luther to the point where he could no longer stand back but needed to say something, needed to start a debate. And the Protestant revolution began in that point, but it had a long lead up. When I was just out of school, I was, had a year overseas in England, I was working there, it was 1989, that was the year the Berlin Wall came down and I was in England watching on television as the German people reunited again across that wall, east and west. It was a profound moment, but it didn't happen just like that. There was years of leadership on both sides. There were years of growing trust and step by step building something that became a point of reconciliation. 
I think of my own conversion. I came from a family that wasn't particularly religious. We didn't really go to church much. I came to faith through reading a Bible. I read the Psalms. I had a profound experience of knowing that the God of Psalm 140, 141 and 142 was my God who would look out for me in the midst of danger and darkness, who would speak for me, who would be with me no matter what. That spoke into my heart and then I found a, a tract on the street, on the pavement in Hamilton where I was growing up, which illustrated in visual terms how when we come to Christ, we put our hearts into God's hands. And I prayed the prayer that was on the tract. That's how I came to faith. God doesn't need particular churches or particular places. God does what God does to bring change. And when we look at this story, you know, Saul is a fearsome, powerful, intelligent man who can do a lot of damage, but God is the God of grace. And God's grace completely changes Saul's life at this point. So many of our poignant episodes in history, like this one, have started with little by little moments and my encouragement to each of you is that this week you will be part of someone's profound moment but you may not know what it is it could be a short word it could be a letter it could be a prayer but each of you will have a role in god's gracious work in others this week may you know how powerful your blessing is. May you know that your prayers are heard and what you do and say matters in eternity. Great disruptive episodes like these, they've just rarely explode un unannounced without some earlier work that's already been going and that's what we're seeing is happening here. Like our journey last week to Emmaus, we look back and we piece together the evidence that points to God's sovereign hand over human history. We recognise the signs that herald the unmistakable hand of God across the span of our days, our weeks, our whole lives. And Paul later writes of this sense of God's ordained path for him which led to this dramatic event on the way to Damascus. And if we look at um, Galatians 1, 17, 11 to 17, he's, this is what he says. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. God was pleased to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. My immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were the apostles before I was, I went into Arabia and later I returned to Damascus. That moment of conversion on the road was the culmination of what began in God's grace before Saul of Tarsus was even born. 
This revelation was an unfolding of the divine plan for salvation and salvation of the Gentiles, people that Saul had absolutely no time for. It's just one of the most lovely things I think. God has a wonderful sense of humour that here was a man, a Jew of Jews, righteous of the righteous, you know, in terms of purity, absolutely disciplined, only focused on doing what is holy in, in, for the Jews. And God takes him and gives him a heart for the Gentiles and says, go, you are the one I've called and anointed to go and, and to speak Jesus to the Gentiles. It speaks volumes of what grace does to a heart that Saul could become Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. And that is what he does in, in most amazing, remarkable ways. I marvel at God's stupendous grace and power. Nothing is wasted in God's economy. I'm reminded also of some of the other stories of God's wonderful interruptions in our human plans. I think about when Jesus was on his way to, to go and, and heal Jairus' daughter. Do you remember the story in, I think it's in Mark or Luke 9, Luke 8? He's on his way. The crowds are all pressing in. It's this busy kind of agenda that's, that's we're off to, to Jairus. He's the temple leader. This is a really significant moment. And a woman who's been hemorrhaging and, and ostracized for decades reaches out and touches Jesus. And Jesus feels the power go out of him. And he stops right there in the middle of this busy passage. He calls everyone back and says, hang on, something just happened. Who touched me? And the disciples say, who touched you? We're, we're crowded in here like Burke Street Mall. We're, we're all, you know, shoved up against one another. What do you mean who touched you? And Jesus calls this moment out because this woman has been ostracised by her, by her medical condition in such a way that she needs to be publicly healed socially as well as physically healed. It's not just enough to know for this woman that she is now physically clean and clear. She needs to be publicly announced as healed so that the whole community will embrace her again. It's a great, I think it's a wonderful example of how God interrupts even our best intentioned ministry. Because that's exactly what Jesus was on the road to do. He was off to do ministry. But ministry then happened in the middle of the street, in the middle of the mall, and God honours that with grace. It's a beautiful story of grace. When things interrupt you this week, when your plans get interrupted, Ask yourself, is this not possibly a moment of God's grace? And God has another plan that's better. Saul's journey begins in rigid, fear-based zeal. And by the time he reaches Damascus, he is a new creation in Christ. It takes the brave disciple Ananias who, who, you know, is another interruption that would really test our, our faith. That, you know, the spirit comes to Ananias and says, oh, I need you to go and lay hands on Saul. Uh, he's, he can't see and he's had a, a revelation. Um, just go and pray for him. And Ananias, with great respect to the spirit, says, um, do you mean that persecuting Saul? Do you mean the one who's been blocking us all up? Do you want me to go to him and pray for him? Yes, that's what the Spirit wants. That's where the power of grace is. And he does. He trusts. And as he prays for Saul, the scales fall from Saul's eyes. He is physically healed of his blindness. And it becomes 
a, a, a moment of holy ground for all of them. For Ananias, he goes down in, in my books as one of the heroes of faith for that kind of courage and trust. Mm. Saul becomes Paul and as he, as he says in Galatians, he doesn't just turn around then and go back to Jerusalem and start preaching there. He actually goes off for many years and learns Jesus Christ as his Lord. He gives it time. I think that's incredibly wise. Real leadership comes out of a heart that's transformed. And Saul's leadership has been fear-based up until this point. And it takes him some years to be transformed in grace. I think there's an encouragement there for us that real change is patient change and it's steady. It's a long obedience in the same direction. Our journeys continue to remind us that God disrupts and delights with those gracious moments of interruption. They spill and erupt in chaotic times and they soothe and reassure in calm times. We never know the way ahead with much confidence, but we know with great confidence that the one who loves us and transforms our hearts will be with us every step of the way. That is our God who faithfully journeys. And I want to finish with this prayer, Song of Love, which is really based from 1 John, 1 John 4. Living God, you invite us to love one another. For love is the heart of your being. Everyone who follows you in the ways of love, of your love, is born of you and know you well. Everyone who does not love does not know you, for you are love. You risked your life in love for us, embodying that love in a human being, vulnerable, unconditional, persistent to the end, our gateway to your presence. In this love, in this, love is shown true. Not that we loved you, but that you loved us to the end and bore the cost of our release from evil's grip. Since you love us so much, you empower us to love one another. And if we love one another, you abide in us and we in you. Your love will bear fruit through us, complete and perfect at the harvest. Amen.